All right. So now you are looking at, uh, actually, how, how many, maybe uh, we'll use the old uh, raise of hands um, reactions inside of Zoom. How many of you are familiar with Home Assistant? Have ever used it? Have a Home Assistant like going? Like raise your hands. Oh, all right, nice. Got one, two. Well, you all should be using Home Assistant. I'm just gonna start there because uh, obviously Jessica and Chris know where it's at because uh, Home Assistant is written in Python. Uh, this is, this whole Home Assistant hub thing, it's all asynchronous Python behind, behind the scenes, behind under the covers. And what I like about Home Assistant is like, I, my uh, my brother's, well, my, my, I guess my sister-in-law, his wife, she's a total home automation nerd, but she doesn't use any hubs. So it's like, she's got a bazillion apps that she like goes through to get to everything. So if you want to like schedule the lights, you got to go to use that specific app. Or if you want to use the other brand of lights, you got to go to that specific app and do that thing over there. Where Home Assistant is a kind of unifying hub for all these things. So bring in all together uh actually oh i am not watching very closely for people who are coming in so pam i don't know if you mind watching the kind of participants and making sure we make sure anybody who needs to get in gets in but yeah this is like the unifying hub and it brings together z-wave and zigbee and your philips hue lights and your wi-fi connected uh, garage door opener and your thermostat and your nest and like Basically, it's got a bazillion integrations for everything you could ever want. So if you go to homeassistant.io, you can see under the integrations tab, there are 2,224 integrations that are listed here. And that's not all of them because you can also install this like third-party add-on that brings in just random GitHub repositories of stuff people have like played with over the years too. So some of the stuff's not even listed here. Uh, if you've got a thing in your house it, and it has a connectivity of some kind, it's probably supported by Home Assistant. Uh, although I asked Mark, so the, the speaker from, what was that, Wednesday? The guy who did the water, the water measuring machine learning uh, sound device. I asked him if his device was supported by Home Assistant and his answer was not yet. Uh, so that gives me hope that it will be support us sometime in the future. And Mark, if you're listening somewhere along the line, I wanna be one of your early beta testers because I wanna use your cool device uh, because I have something somewhere in my house. Um, I don't have his device, but I have the Moen Flow, for example. So water conservation is actually something I was wanting to focus on and actually do something about. Uh, this main overview dashboard is kind of messy because like basically everything under the world in my house is here. So you can see here, I have numerous devices and things going on in my house. Um, probably more than most have going on in their homes, but I have a lot of stuff that I can react to, set you know, time frames for, uh, it just keeps kind of going and going and going. I do have, let's see, here we get on the whole house. Where's my whole house one? My goodness, if I should just go look at the, and sometimes things move around. Here, let, me, let me close this out over there so we can make it a little bit bigger. Ah, here we go. Here, whole home. So we, I, I have a, I literally have a whole home water shutoff valve, but that whole home water shutoff valve will measure today's water usage. So there's like, I've used 244.9 liters of water. So the thing's constantly, you know, it has a little ball in it and has an encoder and it sits and reads like what's going on. And actually they use machine learning inside their system to try and determine what devices are in your home. So they can say, oh, you use so much for showers, so much for toilets, so much for the dishwasher, you know, so much for faucets, because based on the characteristics of the water spinning the little wheel inside their thing, they can figure out, they can classify like what that was, like the washer or whatever it was. It also has a nice benefit of the thing Mark talked about, which is if you have a water leak in your house, even if it's a small micro leak, those things add up. I mean, I think he mentioned like 20 to 30% of like the water wasted in a home is like just micro leaks. And I, I think he even mentioned like something like 20, 30% before you even get to the home is evaporated, wasted, leaked into the environment someplace. So if I can save all the water that actually makes it to my house, uh, I, I'm you know trying to, do, to at least find those leaks now and I can do something about it. So this tool, like using the, the mow and flow, and it's, it's not, his is much a less expensive option than the, the mow and flow. And so I don't know if I could wholeheartedly recommend the flow yet to everybody, 
Uh, I'm definitely more on like the bleeding edge, leading edge, cutting edge for some of this stuff. And I wanted to try it out, but I'll tell you the first day I installed it that night overnight, it does like a test of your house to see if it can detect leaks. And sure enough, I've got like a five gallon per day water leak in the house someplace. It's most likely an old toilet flap or, you know, a, a dripping shower or, or something like that. And so it, it, immediately I can go now track down you know, I luckily have PEX piping in the, in, the, in the house, so I can actually go shut off on the manifold, each of the things, run the test, and it'll tell me exactly where my water leak is, because it doesn't know exactly where it's at in the house. It's pretty close, but it's like you need to go now hunt down that leak. So that's, that's my new mission is to go hunt down that leak and find it. And more than like water conservation, I think someone was telling a story about their like, oh, Darcy, you were telling a story about your, um, your uh, crawl space being flooded. This would have yep. stopped the water. If it detects a large pressure release for some amount of time, it will just actually actuate automatically and cut off the water. So you would have not ended up with a leak. Um, it's really kind of a cool device, so again, to just see if I'm wasting water and see how much, you know, I can point at it with the kids, you know? It's like, I'm, a, I'm the modern day version of my dad. It's like, you know, shut the refrigerator door. You're gonna let all the electricity <laughs> out. Like now I can be like, you're using all the, all the water. So. That, that's one device I have on my system is that Mo and Flow to analyze that. And then you'll see if you've kind of been looking around this like UI, you'll see I've got a bunch of things that are showing me real time uh, power use, usage for things like there's the Apple, the living room Apple TV for like since three o'clock this afternoon. Obviously, no one's turned it on, uh, but that's actually it's sitting idle is using between one and like kind of one point two watts of power just idle um, plugged in doing nothing nothing important anyway the kind of more shocking ones uh, let me find it's probably in the home theater where's my home theater i have an older like amplifier that's plugged in and when it's in uh here it is home theater it's probably in this list of stuff right here where's all the wattage Oh, that's just sensors. Somewhere here, let me, let me just search. Home theater receiver, here we go. This guy, so he's on, uh, I think I can get the graph from here. Now there's gonna be a log book, like it turning on, it turning off. Let me go back over here. Except the UI could definitely use some work. Somewhere in here I've got that, but that's a change, gives you the voltage. Now that TV actually doesn't use a lot of power, which is kind of nice. Some of the newer TV, newer devices are getting a lot better about like their vampire draw on the network is, up, is what I've noticed. Uh, now, so this giant board of all the stuff has got like all the switches. I can turn things on and off. Actually, that light should not be on. Um, but it's kind of fun. I can, where's the, the kitchen right here? So in the kitchen, there we go. I can turn on the counter light. So watch right here. You'll see the, the light. It, it refreshes every few seconds. You should see that light turn on. There you go. Boom. So light turns on. I'm sitting down in the basement. I'm nowhere near. Uh, like where this is all happening in real time. But uh, Home Assistant does have an energy dashboard that is built in. Like this, I've not really customized this much yet. I really would like to do more with this. So I'm hoping folks like Chris and Jessica will tell me, oh, have you seen XYZ plugin? Because you're going to get way cooler things out of that. But I can use, so our power distribution panel has a sense attached to it. And with that sense, it tries to do machine learning to detect what kinds of things are in your house that are, you know, using power when they go on and when they go off. And inside a home assistant, you can use those as sensors to, to trigger automations. Like if, if it knows the washer turns on, even if you don't have a smart washer, you could have it trigger a timer someplace and then like, you know, alert you with a reminder on Alexa that your dryer is done when it notices that electrical load uh, go by and go off. So but it also then tracks like your total usage over, you know, usage over the day. Uh, if you had a solar panel or a battery system, it also integrates with those kinds of systems. So you could actually see your generation. You can see here, 
this energy distribution from grid to home, uh, it's obviously going one direction because I don't have a solar panel array on here. But if you had solar panels and you were generating more power than what you needed from the grid, it would blip back the other way and show you providing power potentially back into the grid. So at some point, part of my goals is to get uh, like a solar distribution set up for the house so that I can see this blip go the other direction instead of always from the grid to me. Uh, let me go back in here. The, some of those sensors that the sense picks up uh, turn up to be devices inside of Home Assistant. And so if I look, any place where there's like wattages shown, you'll see here there's one watt on the sound bar. These are typically uh, the, the sense using machine learning trying to pick up what it thinks the devices are. And you go into their app. Uh, actually, I can log in and show you the app. Again, I, I don't know if I would recommend this device. I think it's still early days uh, for some of these things. So I'm merely showing them to you so you can see kind of what's possible out there. Where do I even log in? To the, here it is, web app. This is the Sense device that basically, they hook it up to the two mains that come into your house, and then it gives you this machine learning that it tries to figure out what's, what's going on. So there's like an always on load. That's like your vampire, like, power supplies plugged in and TVs just sitting idle and things like that. This other is stuff that it's not figured out what it is yet. And so it hasn't, the machine learning hasn't sussed out what this like 300 watts of stuff is running right now. And then you can see here that it has, you know, figured out some things like the Samsung living room TV, because I've installed a Casa TP-Link uh, uh, like power distribution, uh, what do you call it? A uh, surge protector. It has built-in control for each of the outlets that are inside of that surge protector. And it also reports back the draw that each of the outlets is doing. So some of these things are coming from, for example, oh yeah, I wanted to show you the home theater receiver. So that, that one is an older receiver and it's sitting idle is using three watts. Like it is not on, but it is using three watts of power, 24 seven, 365 a day. And what's kind of nice with the um, sense though, is that you can put in what your power, who your power provider is, and it'll tell you like your average cost per month. So it's like 23 cents a month to just sit the home theater thing, just sitting idle and doing absolutely nothing. Now you can see, uh, yeah, you can see here, it got turned on on Thursday, it got turned on Wednesday. Uh, they pulled out, or the kids watched a movie on Saturday night. So that was the movie watching. Uh, it was used 0.5 kilowatt hour of power for them to watch a movie when they turned that specific device on, which is kind of cool. That is the home theater yeah, ethernet switch that I've got sitting there. Again, that's using two watts. The Apple TV is using one watt. But as you start like adding all these things up, it really, really starts to kind of multiply. And so my goal with this setup is I'll set up routines so that I can talk to the lady in the box, tell her, turn on, hey, it's movie time. And then all these things would be completely dead powered off. But because they're connected into a smart power strip, they can now be turned on on demand and then save me you know, 10 to 20 watts in each room of like vampire power. Well, if you take that times the number of rooms we've got, you know, it's probably, a, I bet I can get down a couple hundred watts of active vampire usage here is what I was thinking. Now, anybody stop me for questions? Want to see something special inside of here? Uh, there's some kind of cool stuff, like especially with the power meter. Uh, this gives you real live, that, that is live. That's like literally right now, uh, someone has turned something on and is like starting to use a lot of power. I'm not sure what it is. That's kind of interesting. But you can see here, we were using about 1300 watts moments before that all kind of started to go down. Gabrielle turned her heating. Like yeah, Gabrielle, what do you do? Did you turn on the heater? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> do you have it um, set up to like turn off all of the kids' devices at 12 a.m. so to force them to go to sleep? <laughs> I don't, I have other devices for that um, on the network. I use a Fing box for that. It's definitely not a power saving sink, Chris. That's pretty funny. It's coming from inside the house. I love it. <laughs> uh, if, if it knows what some of the things are, it may tell you as they happen in real time across this um, thing. Let's go back to like, this is a 15 minute view. You can see right here, uh, that was kind of pre-lunch. And then I know that right before the keynote at two, no, right before this, Gabrielle was fixing lunch. That's right over here. 
So right before kind of one o'clock, Gabrielle heated up food in the microwave and, and brought down some soup and things for me. And that's really what all this like uh, spike of energy was right here. This must be your heater. It, it looks like it's going up, getting to temperature and then kind of cooling down and looks like it's doing it again. Cause look at the, the curve is really uncannily the same. So you can kind of start seeing what these things look like. Uh, so it's loading in the data for a day. Um, it'll, it'll also warn me when there's peak days, like you've just reached a new peak, like so many watts used in the house at any point in time. But, so it's kind of fun to look at and watch. And if you're watching it in, in real time, you know, with the now kind of going, if I was to go over here and I'm going to turn off, let's see here. Well, I'll turn on all the backyard lights. So there's all the lights in the backyard just turned on. You should see you know, in a second or two, like a blip over here, although yeah, it's gonna only be about 20 watts of, of power. Typically it'll kind of note and kind of like highlight some power, interesting power things going on. I don't think I have anything I can turn on that brings in that much power. I've really been working on getting rid of anything that's incandescent and going to all LED and anything that's gonna save energy. Is anything in here has got a lot of lights? Yeah, probably not. Oh, so the ones here, like they are hooked up, like the living room Apple TV, I can turn off these from here and it turns it off on the TP-Link power strip. So it's all integrated. Uh, the configuration, you can do a lot of it through the web. Uh, you can also edit a YAML file uh, for these kinds of things. If I come in here to integrations, devices, and services, uh, you, I mean, I've got it's HomeKit bridge compatible. So it actually will detect any HomeKit only devices that are on your network. Uh, you can bring in like that's our garage door uh, it has the you know the the MyQ stuff built into it. It'll detect people, so this mobile app uh, can actually be used to detect like when someone's home, like for presence or gone away. So you can tell when people are kind of traveling back and forth. Um, the meter, that's a fun one. I have the Wi-Fi enabled thermometer that you can put into like your rotisserie chicken, like while it's on the grill. So I can actually have it trigger the lights in the house when my my uh, chicken gets to a certain like temperature on the grill kind of thing. So that's actually hooked directly up to meter for their, their cloud. Here's the sense integration, um, the vacuum cleaners. So there's, you know, three shark vacuum cleaners. I can trigger, for example, the, the two of the vacuum cleaners we have don't have LIDAR on them and they need the lights on for them to run. So I can actually have them turn the lights on whatever room they're in, run the vacuum. And then when the vacuum is done, turn off. So it's been it's been pretty cool. And then we have lots of Hue. I've gone in all in on Philips Hue. I contemplated some of the third parties and I, I decided my sanity was worth more than a couple dollars and went for uh, Philips Hue for a lot of the lighting. Um, it's just it's a solid product that is always working. Um, and if, if I've tried a couple things since then, but that's that's the one that like the, most of our lights are Philips Hue. I've got a couple Z-Wave uh, things in here. So you see the J, uh, Z-Wave JavaScript. These are some of my early devices like the basement lights and some of the door locks are still Z-Wave in the house. And so this actually runs on a Kubernetes, not, it's not Kubernetes yet. Right now it's a Docker Compose cluster in a machine sitting about 20 feet that way. <laughs> and there's actually three containers running. There's the home assistant container, there's the JavaScript to Z-Wave container, and then I have the container running for the thermostat. There's a proxy that I proxy my proprietary thermostat through so that I can get the control for the thermostat over here. So this is actually a, uh, here it is. This is like a carrier infinity uh, thermostat thing, uh, but they don't have a great UI. It's a pretty sucky app, but they do allow you to proxy and for better or for worse, it's unencrypted. So I can actually just like proxy through this other container. And now I get the data coming off my thermostat. <laughs> I don't know why people still do that, but I'm glad they do because I can now not have to deal with their junk and just because their APIs aren't public. I was kind of upset about that. I did some research when we got the new thermostat and that's what I wanted uh, was one that I could have in integrated in here, which is nice because you can then, you know, set it to, to be automated when someone, when the house is empty for some amount of time, you know, shut the thing way down. Some of these systems don't do really good presence detection because they're only in one part of the house. Like the thermostat only sits in like, a certain part of the house. And most of the part of the time during the day, 
we're either upstairs in the study or I'm down in the basement, but we're not on the main floor of the house, so the system will think we're gone. But I can control it better with, with uh, Home Assistant because I've got sensors in here that do a lot more, like knowing when the cell phone is present, like geofenced inside the house. That's kind of what I wanted to show, uh, mostly from the, there's an opportunity here to save some energy and turning off the, a lot of those vampire loads. Um, and now I've not done the research yet to say whether the TP-Link power strip takes more energy than the things that are plugged into it. I don't know that yet. Uh, that's still to be determined. I got to think it is more efficient because that's kind of the whole point of that thing is to be able to automate those loads you know, so that you're not drawing when they're not being used and it's just more modern equipment that amplifier is 20 years old so i'm not surprised it's using three watts just sitting there idle um, i had an old home theater system upstairs the subwoofer when plugged in and in standby not on and in standby was using eight watts 24 7 in standby Holy smokes, that's crazy. That is crazy. I, eight watts. I was like, eight watts? That's, that's not insignificant. So I, that one definitely would pay for whatever power strip I plug into it to turn it off when we're not using it. Because most of the time we're not watching TV. I mean, maybe in an hour, you know, maybe, um, maybe five, six hours a week would that one even be in use. But yet it runs... 24-7, 365, 8 watts straight. Now, when you turn it on, boy, it does pull some power. Uh, some of these things do pull quite a bit. Like you saw with the amp, like it pulls quite a bit of power. Uh, if I go in here to the Bose uh, graph on the Bose soundbar, uh, I'm not getting the graph here. I wonder if you have the same one, because mine's probably about 15, 20 years old. <laughs> yeah, and that's another problem. Like old equipment, just, just way more, less efficient. Um, there is a use, uh, there is a, Potential case to, to be made for buying some newer gear because it's going to draw less like phantom draw uh, for sure. If I go back in here to devices, yeah, the Bose soundbar and standby, you know, when it kicks up, this one gets used a lot more because I'm listening to music uh, quite a bit, but let's see if it pulls in the data for today. That's interesting. I wonder why it's not showing the data. So it enters standby oh, on Tuesday. They do energy star ratings for things other than major appliances, I wonder. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's for real. You can see here, average usage is 11 watts. So like when it kind of fires up and actually is being used, um, see, I used it 77 times this month. So it got turned on from standby and recognizes when it's in standby versus being like on, uh, which is kind of interesting. That's the projector in the basement. Oh, this doesn't look like it's picking up. You know, it's having, it's, Timing out getting data, it looks like. Oh, that's just a little HDMI thing. The interesting ones to watch are like your refrigerator. I think this is the right. Now, another problem with this device, with this uh, Sense device, it makes a best guess. If I go in and edit this uh, item under devices, where do I hit the fridge? Oh, here it is, gear. It's like, this is a guess, or this is actually the thing. And so it, you can manage the device or like, for example, if I go to one where it's like heat number five, I'm not sure what this thing is. So a lot of times you have to go around the house and turn things on and off until you find the one that's like, oh, heat five turned on, heat five turned off. Another issue is a lot of times like ovens or furnaces will have multiple elements that may kick in and they may show up as multiple devices because they're giving off it's all based on vibrations and sounds in the lines. So they may give off multiple sound signatures for the same device. Now it does have a way to, to, take, to account for that is that you can actually merge multiple devices together and say, this is my furnace and this is my uh, oven. Uh, it's, it's something you can actually do in here. But like, I don't know what this thing actually is. It's very, oh, here you go. So when you actually like, you know, type mystery heat. Uh, they got at least a sense of humor about it. Um, but you can actually then say, they give you kind of a confidence level. Was it a dishwasher or was it the floor heater, which I don't have? Uh, you do tell it a little bit about your house, like how many rooms, how many bedrooms. So it can kind of start guessing. It helps bring in the guessing, like uh, uh, confidence levels a little better. 
you can get notified when things turn on and off. Like uh, I figured out that one of the boys was getting up like at one or two in the morning and going to the bathroom because it would show the light flipping on. It's not a smart light at all. It has, it's completely a dumb switch, completely dumb lights, but they were some of the last incandescent lights still in the house. And so when it turned on, it made a lot of noise on the, on the, on the system. So I tell, and I'd ask him about it the next day. Like, did you get up at two in the morning? Like, yeah. Like they were like, were you up? Like, no, I was just looking at the smart stuff. Poor kids can't give away anything here. Big Calvin is watching. <laughs> right? No, no kidding. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, uh, here we go. History. I don't think I can do graphs. Oh yeah, kitchen nightlight triggered. You know, if the the motion detectors this hooks into our alarm system, which I don't use except as sensors. So now I've got sensors on all the doors and motion detectors on the main floor and on the basement, so I can know when people are in certain rooms. I actually use it to turn on a light, like in the, in the middle of the night when you walk through our house, it'll turn on the kitchen counter light. And like for the three minutes, and then you know, usually you're just kind of walking through, so you don't have to worry about turning on a light anymore in the house. It, and, and you also don't have to worry about turning it off. It'll just turn off the light automatically, you know, behind you. Or when you unlock the front door, that's another favorite one of mine. It's, it unlocks the front door, it turns on the front hall light, you know, leaves it on for like ten minutes or five minutes, so you can basically get in the house, get your coats off, and get to your room, and you don't, and then turns it off. Just like an extended version of the one from the garage door opener. It just follows you through <laughs> as you progress. Yeah. Well, that's what I've done. Um, any questions? Comments? I see lots of comments going on in the... Uh... Have you used any of the... Um, I guess you don't have uh, individual like smart lamps, uh, smart plugs, sorry, if you're using this sense... So I do, I do have smart, I do have some of those individual, individual smart plugs. I'm using the sense for most things, but then as I've started like in the home theater areas or where I've got a TV and I may have a couple devices plugged in and I do want to control them explicitly, that's where I've been putting in the TP-Link Casa stuff. Uh, TP-Link, like okay. Yeah, yeah. If I go over here to... Did you have to flash any of that stuff or was it not. already... come? Oh, okay, yeah. I did not. It It... it seems to work where is the integrations tab in here devices because i i bought a bunch of um tekken uh, okay i think it's called the make and it's kind of annoying they like have a their own um app um and like you were kind of say like they actually have an api that you can then expose it to home assistant and i got it working but then it's now no longer connected and it's just kind of annoying but apparently you can flash them, but it seems like a lot of the um, tutorials for doing that are like a few years old now. Yeah, um, I've noticed that too. Yeah, so and the newer any, versions, they seem to be more defensive against Anytime I buy a, a device, I go read the Home Assistant forums first because there's this horror story sometimes. Like they say it works with Home Assistant, but then people are like, yeah, 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 it does. You got to flash it three times in this order specifically, and then you got to enable this like thing and then like turn on experimental mode and like, then maybe it will connect and then it's flaky at best. <laughs> so yeah, you know, exactly. kind of the reason, that was kind of the reasoning behind Hue. So Hue integrates here with uh, Sense and Hue integrates well with the TP link. So then it uses that additional data. So you can see here, you can hook up like Alexa, although I don't know why you would. The Alexa one, all it does is like, you can ask it like, is something on or off? It's, oh, Alexa, cancel. Sorry, she's like listening. She's listening to me, always listening to me. But so you can turn on the network listing so you can reset the models and like all that kind of stuff. But yeah, this, this gives it a little more hints. It's like, oh, I've discovered that you actually have TP-Link devices on there and I've gone through in the TP-Link devices and written out the names of what those things are. And that's why you see over here in the devices like Bose Soundbar or Home Theater Appliance because like, that came from the TP-Link integration. It does work with the um, Hue lights as well, uh, although I'm not seeing them on here. Because normally there would be a, a switch. You know what, the Hue integration is gone. That's new. There used to be a Hue integration and you could turn the lights on and off from the Sense dashboard and then it would use the Hue integration to know like what are the lights on the Hue network 
in here, but it looks like those are gone, which is kind of surprising. Again, I don't know if I'd recommend this device to everybody. It's been an interesting experiment, but most of the time it's pretty, you're still kind of in the dark. And I think the TP-Link and the power, like the, you know, the power control blocks that can measure power on their own are probably a better way to go because then you know exactly what you hooked up to it. Now you can't hook up your furnace to it. This does tell me when the furnace comes on and stuff like that, so. Yeah, I was just surprised that the T the Hue stuff's gone. That's really crazy. Hmm. I also tried to hook up my Fitbit. Oh yeah. So I control the lights with my smartwatch. Yeah, it wasn't also wasn't overly successful. I have to say, <laughs> um, it's a work in progress. <laughs> yeah, Mark, you had a question. Yeah, uh, something else to share if um, we're ready we to jump topics. Um, so I haven't set up Home Assistant. It's inspiring to see all the stuff you configured. Um, but I wanted to get energy metering. And I was like looking at sense, and it looked a little expensive, complicated, wasn't sure if it was going to work. And I found if you get, um, I got a little software defined radio dongle. And then it comes with this antenna. And it can pick up the, um, the utility smart meters broadcast in the clear. Oh. Um, and there's a, I've, I've played with the first stage that'll read the messages off the meter and I can see like 60 of my neighbor's meters as well as my own electric meter and solar production meter. Um, and that's just the, the production value off the meter. And then apparently you can get an MQQT bridge that'll forward that to home assistant. Um, so I want to- That's super cool. So now you can power first. shame your neighbors. <laughs> yeah, if I sneak around at night and get all their meter numbers and then I know who's who. <laughs> right? Um, oh, totally. Our, our gas and water meters, I couldn't see them, but apparently some of them can get picked up too. Hmm. That's pretty cool. I didn't think about the fact that the meters are, you know, read by a software defined radio. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, I, one thing I didn't show you is like the infinite configurability of uh, Home Assistant. You can go through and do it through the web like I'm doing right now, where you can set up these automations. Um, so like, for example, at 1030 every night, uh, it activates the front porch low scene on my front porch because the light was keeping us on, up in our bedroom. Uh, so that's like just that's the, that's the automation part. You can set up the scenes, which is where, oops, let's leave which is like basically what you want things to look like at any point in time during an automation. So a lot of these automations, all these scenes are actually brought in automatically from Hue. So it reads all the scenes you've got in your Hue app and brings that data in and then makes them usable. Um, and then, sorry if I want, yeah, shut down the backyard. So I, I have like all the backyard lights so that I can turn them on and off of my voice, you know, as a one one scene. So I'll set up a scene for them off, and I'll set up a scene for them on, or I'll set up a scene for Christmas outside, or a scene for whatever holiday, so they can just with my voice turn those on, or based on time of year, turn those on and off. Uh, there's also a whole sets. These scripts came from a specific plugin in here. Uh, I've not messed too much with those, and also not messed too much with these blueprints, but it's. You can actually just write this stuff on the file system. Uh, if I go to, where's my, where did, oh, I see it's behind my window here. Here we go. Oh, probably have to misspell it, yep. And if you're not using one password for your SSH keys, you're doing it wrong because it's pretty friggin' awesome. Uh, one password date now gives you an SSH agent that you can configure your SSH keys you know, to use. I have no more private keys on my system. Sorry, side note there, because it's pretty awesome. This is just running Ubuntu on like a little like NUC, like Intel NUC like device over here. And if I go into Haas, and it's you. Here you can see my Docker Compose. It's just not a fast system, uh, as you can see. My goodness. 
Come on. The little computer that could. I need a Pam. Pam, you need to give us some encouragement. You can do it. I believe in you. There we go. Come on. All right. Come on. She believes in you. I believe in you, buddy. There it goes. Okay. You have to so, pay yeah. for it she, now. So here you can see there's the home assistant container, the, the thermostat one, and the JavaScript one. But all the configuration files are just YAML, YAML files in here. So if you look at configurations.yaml, uh, you can see in here, you know, there's configurations for the various integrations, like there's the alarm system or the home kit uh, stuff. Yeah. And then you can tell it to not include secrets. You can actually have secrets you know, included from a separate file. So you don't have to like, if you were checking these into like GitHub or whatever, you can include those things <clears throat> from external files. But everything can be configured in plain text and backed up and, and everything else. So it typically stores the data outside the containers. So the containers themselves, you can blow them away. My upgrade process is literally like uh, Docker pull, and then I just restart the instance, restart that container, rebuilding it. See if there's any updates to the infinitude. Yep, I'm, image is up to date. So I'm on the latest for that one. There's like me getting the latest stable. They just, they just released the stable. So I think I'm already on the latest stable. Oh, no, there's been an update. So we're going to grab a minor update for um, Home Assistant right here, and we'll actually install it. The I.O. on that machine is terrible. Yeah, look how slow it is to extract. Ugh. I need to put a faster disk in that thing. Maybe we'll come... power. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to keep it low power. Like I'm trying to make sure that is a very low power uh, setup there. <clears throat> I do have a PDU, a power distribution unit in that rack that has these plugged into it. So I can actually see the power usage by each of my network devices. So like the switch and the, the this specific device as well. So I'm just gathering all the data so I can start making smart decisions about what to use the data for. How many websites did that machine used to host? Oh, this one, none. This is just a, literally a little, like, it's a little, you know, desktop computer about that big. I kind of had bought it thinking I would use it for a home theater PC type thing. And then never did. And then I repurposed it into a home assistant box since it was low power. And I had bought a, you all remember PFSense? Anybody ever use like PFSense firewall, like router? I bought a PFSense appliance box. And since I've upgraded into using Firewall of Gold, but I repurposed the, the PFSense Firewall box because it was a low power computer to be running Home Assistant at my parents' house. So my parents' house now have like a little embedded, you know, Home Assistant controller sitting in the closet so that I can watch their Ecobee. And I've, I've set up a couple smart door locks and I'm starting to set up some more smart things at their house. Kevin, you said uh, you're running this on an Internuke. Do you see any comparison between an X186 or an R RRM uh, processor for running those applications? So this one is an, I think this one's X86. Uh, so I've not tried running this on ARM. And since I'm running it in Docker, I'd want to make sure I'm running the same architecture because I wouldn't want that overhead. Yeah, indeed. But the question is, RAM, uh, RAM is normally much more energy efficient. As right. You decide. That's a good question. Well, OK, Here, here's a great question. Has Docker Hub removed Home Assistant images yet? Or have they paid? Must be Home Dash Assistant. There it is. Uh, so they got the sponsored open source badge so you have to now apply to get free docker hub hosting like that's a, this is a this week thing what i'm talking about here so be careful if you're using some uh docker images that are for open source projects and they don't pull anymore they get like a 404 not found it's because of exactly what we're talking about right here uh these they do have uh arm arm v6 so that's because they support raspberry pi jessica said she was running hers on a pi 4 and that's on arm so they have native Pi 4 images. 
uh, and other ARM support, it looks uh, right here. So it's interesting they have 386 support. I don't think the latest Linux kernel even supports 386 anymore, does it? I thought they ended that. No more 32-bit. <clears throat> but yeah, so there's ARM support. Ah, there we go. So now I can show you basically how the upgrade goes. We pulled the latest image. We can just do a stop and I'll remove, actually I'll do a Docker Compose RM, which removes the existing containers and stops them first if they were running. And since there's nothing in that container I care about, they're truly immutable. All the data is sitting on the file system and bind mounted up into the containers. It's, it's no big deal. You can do these upgrades on the fly. My next step is literally, I want to do a Kubernetes cluster in the house and run these containers on the Kubernetes clusters instead of here. Um, the probably biggest challenge there is gonna be the networking. Uh, I'm running the home assistant, so here we go, build. So we'll do Docker Compose up, dash, dash, build. That'll trigger Docker Compose to grab the latest image on the uh, and make a new container at that point uh, from the Docker Compose file. The biggest challenge with Kubernetes is going to be networking because the Home Assistant uh, image itself or container is running like an host networking mode where it basically is on the same network as the host machine is as opposed to being in the, the Docker specific network. Uh, you can see that right here on, where, oh, it missed me under networks. I've got the network set up for Z-Wave and Infinitude. I thought, or maybe I hadn't done it yet because the the reason to do that is because the home kit things and some of the other things that want to discover on the same subnet need to be on that network to be able to do the broadcast or you need to install another container that does bridge you into that network and can relay those broadcasts back to Home Assistant, that's where the, the Home Assistant stuff can get, can get kind of tricky. Uh, yeah, I thought it was on networking, network Z-Wave. I must not have had the network mode set for it. I thought I did. So at the moment, while your Home Assistant is down, um, how gracefully does everything in your house degrade? And like, do things that's typically been, catch that's up? That's been important um, because not everyone is forgiving uh, when it comes to devices not working. Um, so every, all the devices, that's another nice thing about Home Assistant, is really uh, as much as possible not cloud reliant. Now it will tell you, like for example, like Philips Hue, it'll tell you if it, if it requires uh, like cloud access or not, or whether it can run strictly without the cloud. So I think this one's local push and so it actually uh, doesn't require a cloud connection to still work Home Assistant with uh, the Philips Hue lights that are in the house. If I look back here at some of my integrations, yeah, so this is already reloaded. We're on the latest version. Yep. So yeah, see the ones with the cloud icon like this? Those are the ones that are requiring cloud APIs to interact for those specific things. So if the, if the, if the network is down, I can't use the garage door through Home Assistant. Obviously, I can still go use the garage door from the button, which is important. Uh, also, the Philips Hue, as long as the network is up and the Hue Hub is up, the Zigbee Hub, then all those devices can still operate. Like I can use the remote switches that I've got set up or the remote controls for some of those lights. That'll all still work. Um, not The only thing that would stop working in my house right now if the Home Assistant itself is down would be any of the scheduled automations. So things that were triggering in Home Assistant itself. But like the switches all still work. That was important was to make sure that it would still function like a house. I've been in homes where they have these smart panels and if the hub is down, you can't turn anything on or off. Like that, that is, that's kind of a non-starter. That's itching, WebSocket timing out. That's new. But you see it depends on the cloud. Like the cameras I'm using, are I've got them firewalled off so they can't talk out to the outside world, but they can talk to the Home Assistant. So when you're seeing these camera views, those are not available except through Home Assistant.
but it's kind of nice. You, know, you can see, you know, the trash truck coming. You, you can, with Home Assistant, you can actually run ML models. So they have support for like TensorFlow. So you can feed these images from these cameras into the models. And for example, have it watch for your, your trash containers to see if they move or not. And then you know like whether the trash has been picked up and without you having to go look. Um, one of my little dream pet projects would be to like put in some kind of classification to see if a cool car came by. So if a cool car started coming in the neighborhood, I'd want to know so I could go like watch it and go by. You'll see, if you've ever been on a call with me, you'll notice I've got a Galaga machine behind my shoulder, typically on the Zoom calls. I've put that on a switch so that I can turn it on and off because when it's sitting, I'll turn it on. When it's on, uh, the power it uses, you can see here Galaga current is currently at zero. There we go, 37 watts just powering up right there. Whoa, um, that's crazy. Yeah, so you, I don't know if it'll give me like a real-time graph or not. But yeah, it's at 38 watts. So it's it's using some power to turn on that old, it's an old LED panel, like an old Dell, Dell LED panel, not a, not a modern one. And so it uses a lot more energy, a lot more power. It's just a Raspberry Pi 4 inside there. I'm surprised the graph isn't giving me, I guess this, just maybe the graph's not refreshing. I thought maybe we'd get a real-time graph of the power in there. The sense should show it if the Galaga is on. I'm not sure what that is. Let's see here. Oh, I mean, maybe I've not added that device. Oh, here it is right here, Galaga. It's just not picked it up yet. So you can see when I turn on, like whenever, I'm, whenever I come in for the morning and I'm gonna be on calls, I'll turn it on because I have it hooked up to the lady in the box to turn it on and off for me. So you can set up routines. Like I have a routine set up in Home Assistant. There's a scene in here. Uh, where is it at? I had set up a scene in the study. Here it is. Ah, Calvin work mode. So Calvin work mode turns on my desk lamp, turns on the R2-D2 lamp behind me, turns on Galaga, and turns off the overhead lamps that are right above me, but leaves the ones on that are above Gabrielle in the study, because she wants to have light but I don't want the light coming from above when I'm on the camera. So you can set up some scenes like that. But it's caused me to turn off that Galaga machine now because I realized how much power I was using. We were using like 40 watts just hanging out there. So I'll turn it off because no one's up there to use it. You can, it's kind of funny, total today's consumption. I don't know if you can see like, oh yeah, you can go back by a day. So let's go yesterday. I guess I was, I've not been up there. Let's go last week, this week, last week. There it is. So it's turning it on. So total consumption of the Galaga machine over the last week, over the same day, comparing. <laughs> If you put quarters in it, does it go down? <laughs> You're right, cost less. 